to everybody, let me just uh, share my uh, my iPad. So this is this is going to be my talk. And uh, thank you very much to and for to Andrew for giving an introduction to the application of abstract convexity to augmented Lagrangians. And um, uh, I, I hope that I will uh, help to make to 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 make clear how important it is the application of abstract convexity and how enjoyable as well it is. Um, okay, so this uh, is a joint work with Joa Bui, Alexander Kruger, and David Yost. Joa is currently a postdoc at Curtin University. Ale Alexander Kruger is from Federation University, one of the organizers of this meeting, and David Yost also from Federation University. And this talk is, of course, dedicated to our friend and leader, Alex Rubinov, who uh, was the one who taught me all I know about augmented Lagrangians and abstract convexity. So anyway, I will start with some motivation and some uh, zero duality gap. First of all, recalling some facts from the classical setting and then uh, looking at the fact of zero duality gap from the point of view of abstract convexity. So I will just introduce very quickly the, the abstract uh, linear and affine functions. Then I will go on to define what are abstract convex functions. And I will mention how abstract convexity can extend strong constraint qualifications results that establish zero duality gap. And finally, a new constraint qualification that I will present here in this talk uh, that was introduced in this paper, and it's uh, the closest possible characterization of optimality. So to my knowledge, is the weakest constraint qualification that I know. And then I will finish with an example, of course, a non-convex example in which we show how this constraint qualification can be put to work. And I will end up with some uh, open questions. Uh, so I will start by recalling a beautiful sentence uh, that you can find in Rockefeller and Wett's book, Variational Analysis. There, there is a chapter, chapter 11, for, uh, called the duality chapter. So I really recommend everybody to enjoy this chapter. And it says that in the realm of convexity, almost every mathematical object can be paired with another, said to be the dual of it. <clears throat> and on the basis of this duality, closed connections between otherwise disparate properties are revealed. And here comes the most important relationship. So the general framework for duality is built around a transform that gives an operational form to the envelope representations of convex functions. So everything is, is going around this concept of the envelope representation of convex functions. And this has to do with what Michel Thera was telling, was telling us this morning. So let's uh, look a little bit with more detail. What is the envelope representation? What are we talking about when we refer to an envelope? Take any topological space, which is a non-empty set. So a set with a topology, with a set of so-called open sets, and those correspond to the topology, and take any non-pathological function defined in such a set. By non-pathological, I mean not identically plus infinity, but a function that goes to our union infinity, and this is the flower that uh, that they were mentioning this morning uh, about uh, this, this uh, I think it was Andrew Everhart that referred to the, uh, to the representation of Alex Rubinov of the extended line. So take any function that goes from X to R infinity and look at a very important piece of work in in convex analysis, which is the Legendre Fenchel conjugate of the function f, which is the supremum over the set 
x of the linear function on v minus f of x. So let's uh, let's uh, go back a little bit. I was a little bit too quick. So the facial conjugate is a function that is defined in the dual space. And what is the dual space? Is the set of linear functions which are continuous with respect to the topology. So I have here a non-empty space which has a vector structure. So it has a sum and the multiplication by a scalar. And then it has a vector space structure. So you have linear mappings which are continuous in, in, with respect to that topology. And those linear mappings which are continuous with respect to the given topology are called the linear functionals of the space and they form the dual space. The dual space is the domain of the conjugate function. And then the conjugate function at every single one of these continuous linear functionals is the supremum over all x of the continuous linear functional minus f of x. And this is the conjugate function. And the nice thing about this operation, so this is the envelope representation of a certain function. And so this is a, this is some kind of regularization of the original function in the sense that by doing this operation, you obtain a function which is in, in many senses much better than the original one. First of all, it is convex because it's the supremum of affine functions and therefore convex. And second, it is lower semi-continuous, which means that the epigraph is a closed set with respect to the original topology. So you get a lot of advantages just by applying this operation to this function f. And moreover, this, this um, the construction of primal dual pairs in optimization is based on, the, on this envelope representation. So everything that has to do with duality is connected with this envelope representation. And moreover, the envelope representation, as we know by the famous fenchel moreau theorem, is a characterization of lower semi-continuity and convexity in the sense that every function that has those nice properties that I just mentioned that the conjugate function has, every function which is lower semi-continuous and convex is the convex conjugate or is the upper envelope of some other function which happens to be the convex conjugate. So it goes either way. So the upper envelope can be seen as a characterization of convexity and also good, good, good behavior of functions. So here is the this here is the expression of my function f as the upper envelope of a family of functions, right? And in fact, it is the pointwise supremum of a family of affine functions because this part is linear plus a certain constant. So we see that there are two key aspects of the of this upper envelope, which were mentioned this morning by Michel Terra, that we take the supremum of affine functions. So this is one of the aspects, the set of the functions over which the supremum is taking, taken, sorry. However, if we stay with the set of affine functions, it is clear that we will never be able to get out from the convexity framework because the supremum of affine functions is affine. This means that we must let go, uh, let go uh, the fact that this, the family is affine and change the set of functions and take the soup operation. So retain the aspect of the upper envelope, but just change the family of functions. Uh, and what is the gain of doing that? The gain of doing that is that as mentioned by Andrew Everhart just before, it allows us to retain all the global properties because the sub operation 
includes the idea of having minorants everywhere, everywhere, uh, of, of having those minorants uh, that are below my function. And that minorant operation is happening everywhere. That's why we retain the global properties. So as we, so thus we arrive to the fa famous, to, to the most crucial part of the idea of abstract convexity, which relies on changing the family, the family of basic functions by some other elementary functions or also called abstract linear. And then again, I will, uh, I will quote part of what Andrew Eberhard just quoted from the preface of the book of abstract convexity, but I just, my, the length of my talk was shorter, so I could, <laughs> I could take a shorter paragraph. So my, my paragraph is a part of what he said, but essentially it says that when you look at the, at the generalized derivatives, you obtain global approximation in a neighborhood of a given point. And this is very useful for lo local extrema. However, local approximation alone cannot help to solve many problems in global optimization. So there is a clear need to develop special global tools for solving these problems. And this is, this is the basic of retaining the supremum operation. So abstract convexity is the main tool that will allow us to establish global properties in the study of non-convex optimization. And there are many other important properties. I will uh, say that it provides fresh interpretations of existing notions. And I think that Andrew Eberhardt clearly have shown us previously. It uncovers links between previously disconnected facts and, other, and also it furnishes elegant and unified framework for global optimization. And moreover, as Adil Bagirov has mentioned uh, many times in, the, in, in, in this morning, many applications of, of abstract convexity can be found for functional analysis, approximation theory, set valued analysis, and of course, non-convex analysis. Now let's go to a zero duality gap, which is the main topic of today's talk. And I will recall a general setting, which I like very much. It's a general setting that, that is based on the idea of monotropic programming from uh, Terry Rockefeller. So he, he uh, developed a model of primal dual problems in which he considers um, the minimization of a sum of functions, unconstrained minimization. And therefore it's easy by using French field duality when you construct the dual, it has a very nice symmetric structure. So the, the primal is the minimization of a sum of functions and the dual is the maximization of minus the conjugate of the functions. And the constraint is a constraint over a subspace of the dual space. So the, the general setting for this uh, is a little bit more general than the original setting, but it's a, you, you just need to have separation properties. So you can uh, have this in a Banach space or a locally convex space, X non-empty, and these functions are in general, proper and lower semi-continuous. So uh, the, our, our general structure can be like this. Uh, the, classical, the classical setting uses convexity of these functions here. And we will denote by V of P and VD, the optimal primal and dual values respectively. Now, this is going to be the, the the general setting, even though we will not assume in our analysis that capital X is a Banach space. In fact, in the analysis of extra convexities, one of the main beauties of it is that most of the assumptions are not made on the basic primal space, but most of the assumptions are made on the dual space, on the space of elementary functions. 
that the, in, in there is where the main assumptions take place. Okay, so uh, in order to write down the zero duality gap conditions, I need to recall some convex analysis tools. Uh, and the, the main tool I want to recall is the epsilon subdifferential at a given x. So you give an epsilon non-negative and the epsilon subdifferential is a point to set mapping such that at every x is a set of uh, is a set of continuous linear mapping, so it is a set of dual elements, such that f of x minus f of y, so the difference of f of x minus f of y is above the difference of the dual, the, the linear function at y minus the dual function at x minus epsilon. I'm writing it in this way because I just want to write this. So this generalizes the linear function at y and this generalizes the linear functions at x. That's why I'm showing it in this way. Of course, this inequality makes sense if f of x is a real number. Otherwise, this set is empty because nobody can be here. Uh, okay, so this is the epsilon sub differential which I, I am recalling now in the classical setting of convex analysis. And of course, the subdifferential is just the particular case when epsilon is equal to zero. So no, no epsilon here, epsilon is equal to zero. So I just have f of x, f of y minus f of x larger than L of y minus L of x. Okay, so this is the subdifferential. And another important tool that we are going to use is the infimal convolution. The infimal convolution is, is a very interesting tool that somehow comes up surprisingly almost everywhere in convex analysis. So what is this infimal convolution? Take X, oh, sorry. Take X, a space where you have a sum, let's say can be a vector space, and you have a sum, in, in, this sum satisfies a property that for every natural number m, I can write down x as the sum of m elements, m other elements of capital X. So in other words, every element of the space x has an additive decomposition of any length that you would want. Now the infimal convolution is you take all those positive added, all those possible additive the compositions of x and then compose and then apply your functions psi one to x one plus psi m to xm, take the sum of all these and they take the infimum and that this gives you the infimum convolution. And this infimum is, um, is said to be exact when it's attained as some particular additive decomposition. In that case, you say that your infimum is exact. Your infimal convolution is exact. So the infimal convolution can, can be computed, can be applied to any finite, any finite family of functions defined in X. Uh, okay, now let's go back to our classical setting that I mentioned before. Now the zero duality gap can be written in terms of the tools that I have just mentioned to you. So the, it is easy to see from the definitions, just from the definitions, just from the definitions, that the zero duality gap between primal and dual problem are equivalent to the equality of two very important functions at zero. So remember that zero is in this case an element of the dual space. And at that point zero, the infimal convolution of the conjugates should be equal to the conjugate of the sum at zero. And as I mentioned before, I wanted to stress, this is equivalent to having zero duality gap. So this is the weakest possible condition you could have to have zero duality gap. And therefore, 
if you have any condition that implies this equality, then you will have that that condition is a constraint qualification for zero duality gap in convex optimization. Now let's go to the abstract convexity setting. In the abstract convexity setting, as I said to you, we uh, take a, a, a non-empty set in which we have an addition defined. So there is an operation which we can call the addition. And we have a function L defined in capital X that goes to the real line. And L is going to be closed also for the sum. So we need to be able to sum elements of this family. And such that L also has this additive decomposition property. In other words, for every M, we can write down every, every element in this calligraphic, calligraphic L as the sum of another elements in the family, M other elements in the family. In particular, if zero belongs to this family, then L verifies this property. Right, so if, the, if we call this property star, if, if L is as simple as any set of functions which contains zero, then we will be able to satisfy this property by taking L1 equal to L and all the other elements equal to zero. Okay, so what are we asking from our family of linear functions? Remember that this can be any other family. They are not necessarily linear. Let's call them elementary as Adil was mentioning before. So this family of elementary functions is close for the sum and it satisfies this uh, additive decomposition property. And of course the abstract conjugate we can define in this setting is just replacing the, what we had as Vx, we replaced it by the function, elementary function L applied to X, right? So this is the abstract conjugate exactly defined in the same way. The abstract subdifferential is exactly defined in the same way again. Remember that instead of L by we have Vi and instead of Lx we have Vx. So this is a, a reminder of the fact that this is no different than what we have in classical convex analysis. And the abstract affine functions, they are defined in exactly the same way as we do it in functional analysis. They are going to be the set of elementary functions, but plus any real, any constant, any real constant. Now let's uh, look at what what do abstract convex and abst uh, abstract convex functions and abstract convex sets look like? Um, maybe I will do it uh, in parallel. I don't know how much time I have <laughs> still. Adil, can you tell me how much time I have? Eight minutes. Eight minutes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so. Uh, the, we will define convex functions, abstract convex functions and abstract convex sets. Um, so if you can take home some message, let's, let's uh, make it clear. Uh, let's make people remember what, is, what are abstract convex functions. So we define a, a su su support set, which is the set of all affine functions, which are minorants of F. And we say that F is L convex if F is the upper envelope of some set of, of some subset of elementary linear functions. And we will say that F is H convex if F is the upper envelope of some elementary uh, affine functions, right? So um, if, if I have a subset of affine functions such that F is the upper envelope of those functions, and this means that at every X, uh, is the supremum of all the set, this set of real numbers, then we say that F is going to be H convex. So uh, in this sense, uh, let's us remind ourselves that if you have a convex function from classical analysis, classical convex analysis, if you have a convex function, which is not lower semi-continuous, then your convex function will not satisfy this property. 
So obviously there is some, it's some pathology in that convex function, which is not lower semi-continuous, which is not going to happen in the, in the context of abstract convexity. So abstract convexity automatically avoids those pathologies. pathologies. And a similar property holds for abstract convex sets. If you have a set which is convex with respect to L, it means that it satisfies a strong separation property. It means that the, for whenever you have an, a, 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 an elementary linear function which does not belong to the set C, then you can separate that elementary function by using some suitable X in capital X. And here you should see this as a strong separation property. And the same for H convex sets. A set is H convex if whenever you have an, an element which is not in, in C, then you can separate it by using a, a, a suitable capital X, right? And, and you have strong separation. So again, in the same way as the case of non-lower semi-continuous convex functions, if you have a convex set in Rn which is not closed, then it is not going to satisfy this because you will take a point in the boundary which does not belong to the set and you will not get a strong separation property. So this auto is automatically discarded if you are working in the framework of abstract convexity. So abstract convexity somehow clears the, clears the way to work with some more uh, more interesting objects, uh, even from the point of view of convex analysis. Now let's look at the characterization uh, that gives uh, that we get through uh, abstract convexity. So a function is going to be, so the following statements are equivalent. A function is H convex if and only if it is the upper envelope of its support functions so here is the upper envelope exactly of the support functions. Otherwise, if it's not H convex, only an inequality uh, holds here. And moreover, and this is, this is much more interesting, and we are going to go, come back to this later if I have time, is that if your function is, is uh, abstract convex, this is equivalent to the fact that for, for every epsilon positive and for every X in the domain, the epsilon subdifferential is non-empty. So this is very, very important. So the abstract convexity characterizes the non-emptiness of this important set. And again, of course, Fenchel Moreau. So this also gives us an idea of why abstract convexity provides us with a more clean, clean framework for working. So uh, automatically it tells us that you will have the Fenchel Moreau property holding for everybody who is convex, which is not in general true in classical convex analysis for non lower, sem for non -lower semi-continuous function. Okay, so let's just go to one of our results in, in this paper. So now we are in the framework of abstract convexity. Uh, this does not mean that I will assume the functions here to be abstract convex, we will not. We will uh, just assume that these functions here are defined in X and they go to R plus infinity. And we will, we will assume that the sum has a non-empty domain. So the, the domains are, uh, are have a point of intersection. So the following three statements are equivalent. First of all, if I take the epsilon subdifferential of the sum of the functions, they are going to be contained in the sum of some epsilon subdifferentials, probably not the same, but the epsilon subdifferentials will be enlarged a little bit by some k post a k greater than one. So these epsilon subdifferentials will be a little bit larger. However, it is very important the fact that the epsilon subdifferential of the sum be included in the sum of the epsilon subdifferentials. This is a very important condition of stability of the derivative of the sum. This condition is going to be equivalent to the following condition, which is another epsilon subdifferential formula, that the epsilon subdifferential of the sum is 
it can be written as the arbitrary intersection for every eta positive of the union of some sums of epsilon sub differentials. This, this uh, equality is, um, is an equality related with something that holds in classical convex optimization. But in classical convex optimization, we have a closure here in the middle. So when you assume that this equality is true, you are making a strong assumption. This is like a constraint qualification condition. And these two conditions are equivalent, and this is all in the setting of abstract convexity. They are equivalent to these two functions being equal everywhere over X star. So this is uh, these two conditions here are equivalent to the equality of these two functions. And of course, the equality of these two functions implies that they are going to be equal part in particular at zero. If zero happens to be in the set of linear functions, because this is not an assumption of this theorem. In this theorem, we make only those two assumptions that I mentioned before. L is closed for the sum and L has an additive decomposition. Under those unique, simple, mild assumptions on L, you can show the equivalence of these three facts. And in fact, this theorem extends a theorem that uh, was obtained by Borwein, myself and Zhao in 2012 for the convex case. So in our assumption, we made all the assumptions of having a locally convex, a locally convex uh, space, vector space. And of course, our functions were convex. So look at all the additional assumptions that we made. However, I can tell you that the basic idea of the proof is all contained in all the ideas of abstract convexity. Because the proof of this result, which is not trivial, I can tell you that it was, it, wasn't, it was not a trivial proof, is all based on the idea of conjugate, the idea of epsilon subdifferential, the idea of infimal convolution, and mainly it does not require abstract convexity of the FIs at any point in the whole proof, which is very interesting. However, uh, I just want to give a, a warning that if some of the FIs is not abstract convex, then, uh, for example, some of these sets might be empty because uh, if one of the functions is not abstract convex, then it, the epsilon sub differential might be empty at some point, and therefore this sum might be empty. So these uh, this right hand sides might represent empty sets. So the whole setting becomes vacuous. Okay, so we don't want to make statement about vacuous sets. However, it's nevertheless nevertheless surprising the fact that we can let go of all those assumptions and still obtain these results. Okay, now let's go to um, the, the next condition, which is what are the minimal assumptions that you could think of? So let's start to dream about what are the minimal assumptions we can ask when we ask about zero duality gap. So do we just want zero duality gap or we also want to solve the problem? Do we also want a solution of the problem? Let's assume that we do. In that case, what you would want to have is to have a solution of the problem and that solution for it to be a non-pathological problem should have a primal value, which is not infinity. So you would want a primal value, a, an optimal value, which is not infinity and to have a solution. Now, because under the general setting that I have shown to you before, you always have weak duality. So this inequality is always true. So asking for finiteness of the optimal primal value implies finiteness of the optimal dual value. This means that if we require to have a solution and to have zero duality gap, we just have to add one equality to the previous equality I had shown you before. In fact, the previous equality corresponds to zero duality gap. And this equality here corresponds to having a solution. 
Now, abstract convexity allows us to establish a very beautiful equivalence to these two equalities. And let me just take you to that situation. Now, let's assume that our set of elementary functions has zero, right? So it's a quite a mild assumption. Let's assume that our set of linear functions has a zero and also that the optimal value, primal value is, M, is uh, finite. The following statements are equivalent. Okay, so this is what we want to have a solution and zero duality gap, which is equivalent to this other yellow box here. Now the minimum co constraint qualification for this is that zero should be in the intersection for all epsilon positive of this sum of the sum of the epsilon sub -differential. So this is like the daughter of all the constraint qualifications or the daughter of all the optimality conditions because it's the intersection for every epsilon positive of all these sums. So this green box is the minimum possible constraint qualification you can think of. And this is what we are able to prove under these very, very mild assumptions. Okay, so uh, we are going to see this uh, in action uh, in, an, in a concrete example. Now, uh, just let me go to the following result. Uh, by adding just a, a very, very small, uh, very small assumption to the set of elementary functions, we will add the idea of pointwise convergence. So up to now, we worked with a set of elementary functions that had no topology whatsoever. Now let's add a topology. So the topology will say that if you have a sequence, Ln will converge to, a, to an elementary function, L if and only if it does so at every point X in, in, in capital X. And this convergence here is a convergence in the real line. And this is exactly the weak star topology in classical functional analysis. So we are not asking more than classical analysis. Assume that both f and fi are functions defined on x and they go to infinity. And then the following facts are true. First of all, because of this pointwise convergence topology, we are able to, to conclude that the, con the conjugate function is always lower semi-continuous, that L and, L, L and H convex sets are closed, that all epsilon subdifferentials are closed sets, and moreover, is even stronger condition that the closure of all these unions is contained in the sub in the epsilon subdifferential of the sum. So this is a, th this this uh, property allows us to conclude that a, a fact that I haven't been able to state until now is that the sum of h convex functions is h convex. So if, uh, if each of these functions, if each of the fi's is h convex, then each of these epsilon subdifferentials is going to be non-empty and therefore the right-hand side is going to be non-empty and therefore the sum is going to be h convex. Okay, so um, I'm almost out of time. Let me go then to the example. Let me go to the example. So uh, we are going to apply uh, our example to this function, which is clearly a non-convex and non-differentiable example. And uh, we are going to um, construct our example as follows. The, the first function is a function which is non-convex and the other two functions are non-convex and non-differentiable. And uh, so we, when we sum these three functions, we obtain, of course, a non-convex problem. And this is our corresponding dual. And we are going to apply our green box condition to this set, to this uh, pair of primal dual functions. It is a fact, non-trivial, but it is a fact that each of these FIs is H convex with respect to the following set of elementary functions. Now the elementary functions are these forms a times x squared 
where A is any real number. So it can be uh, either positive, negative, or zero. So it's, a, and it satisfies the pointwise convergence property and it satisfies all the assumptions I mentioned before. And the, uh, the affine functions are going to be these elements plus a real number. Now, if you take, if you take this structure, uh, this abstract structure, then you can see that x equal plus or minus one satisfies this green box condition where you compute the epsilon sub differential using the tools of abstract convexity. So you, you can see that plus and, mi plus and minus one are the global minimizers of these functions. And this is something that you can obtain by using the uh, abstract convexity here. So this is uh, just a, a small example, which by the way, was totally devised by Hoa, who is uh, one of the persons whom I, I can uh, credit myself for making, a, for, um, making her to be interested in uh, abstract convexity. So she came up with this example and with these uh, beautiful graphics. So now let's go to uh, the open questions. Uh, so we have seen that we can uh, obtain interesting results by equipping the uh, set of elementary and affine functions with the pointwise convergence topology. And it would be interesting, uh, just uh, taking up what uh, Andrew Eberhardt mentioned, to, uh, to study uh, abstract convexity properties uh, in terms of continuity of the epsilon sub differential in this in this setting. Now, interestingly, we could think about extension to infinite sums of functions, which is uh, um, which has applications in network optimization, and also to uh, extensions to the problem of finding a zero in the sum of maximally monotone operators, because we have seen that the uh, conditions that I mentioned before, in here, these conditions, for example, are all in terms of uh, enlargements. Uh, they, they are more or less in terms of enlargements of subdifferentials. Therefore, it would be interesting if we can get a constraint qualification for this problem. Uh, and also and I, a good idea for duality. So up to now, I haven't been able to find a connection between duality for variational inequalities and duality for optimization. So if in all the cases, I wasn't able to see a nice interplay between this. So uh, that's something that I think that abstract convexity can come to help. Okay, and I just wanted to share with you um, a memory here of a time when uh, Alex Rubinov and Sari and Rafael, uh, Raf Rafael Gasimov came to visit us in Adelaide uh, in 2003. And uh, of course, Alex was always checking his email. <laughs> he, he would uh, do that all the time, uh, but he was always, always being the uh, connection between all of us. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Regina, for very interesting talk.